After 25 years of silence, David Adair, now a space technology transfer consultant, has come forward with his amazing experience inside the military's top secret UFO facility. I was uh, 13 years old when I built my first rocket and it left the backyard at about 3,500 miles an hour. I was able to build it out of a construction uh, machine shop that my father owned when he used to work for uh, the mechanics and racing enterprises and we had plenty of uh, equipment and tools that allow such manufacturing to be done. As a matter of fact, our shop's very similar to a rocket shop in equipment and materials. Mm -hmm. The rockets kept getting bigger, faster, uh, till finally I was able to uh, get funded by a federal grant by a congressman named John Ashbrook. And with that help, I was able to go ahead and complete a larger rocket with an entirely new type of engine, which was a fusion containment engine. The two primary engines we use today are solid propellant and liquid propellant. Uh, there are about 61 different rocket engines of propulsion systems that you could leave this planet with. Uh, two of them are just a solid and liquid fuel. I happen to just pick one out of the other 61 engines to pick from. And I manufactured a magnetic fusion containment engine, which um, in simple essence is able to create a magnetic field capable of holding a thermal fusion reaction inside, like a chunk of the sun contained in a magnetic bottle. And when you tap that power, it allows you to have tremendous uh, thrust, which is what makes the rocket go forward. And uh, so imagine being able to tap onto the power of the sun for an acceleration factor. So that's a pretty interesting engine design. So once the engine was, uh, and the rocket was completed, we uh, obviously couldn't launch it where I was launching smaller rockets, which were out in cow fields in uh, Ohio. So we had to go to um, White Sands in Mexico, and that was uh, arranged by the congressman and a consultant at the time who was a retired general named Curtis LeMay. And um, Curtis LeMay made the arrangements from Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. We rode down to White Sands on a C-141 Starlifter, and when my rocket myself got there, we started prepping it for a launch. Um, at the time that we launched, which was June 20th, 1971, um, a plane flew in the same day we did, and out stepped uh, these men in black suits with mirror sunglasses, and they're DOD agents. And so DOD was interested in the um, operation, and they were alerted to it by the Air Force and probably the Congress and whoever else was funding the program. Um, among those men, uh, there were some NASA officials there that I recognized. Um, they instructed me to send a rocket down 656 miles northwest of there to a precise set of coordinates that they gave me. And I asked them, why are we landing in a dry lake bed in, uh, in Nevada? And they said, uh, just drop it there. And I said, I can do that. So we fired the rocket and it was a really success as far as engines go. It was extremely fast. It was so fast you couldn't even see it leave. It's like, um, you ever try to watch a rifle bullet leave a barrel? That's how fast this engine was. So we landed um, about, well not about, we were exactly where they wanted it. Then we had to get on a DC-9 from White Sands and leave for um, the dry lake bed, which is called Groom Lake in Nevada. And I was asking them, uh, do you all notice that these uh, wheels on your plane, the rubber tires and landing gears, are going to bore more up to our belly in the dirt out there. So they said, don't worry about it. So we got on the plane, and when we got there, uh, they were right. There were twin 10,000-foot runways there and hangars and a 42,000-acre Air Force base uh, called Groom Lake. And it wasn't on any of the maps I was working with at the time. So um, my rocket was down on the south end of the field at the end of the runways, and you could see the parachutes um, bellowing in the wind, and we landed and got out. And um, I was assuming we were going to go look at my rocket right then. Uh, no, we got in golf carts and rode to the center hangar, which was a very low, flat-type hangar, but extremely large inside, about the size of about four football fields. So we pull in there and stop in these little golf carts, and we're just sitting there. And I'm going, well, that hangar's empty. I thought, this is interesting, you know. 
And then a few minutes, a uh, little yellow and red lights came on flashing, and um, then out of the ground or out of, out of the floor come these little rails with chains on them. And they came up around all the doorways, and then the entire floor dropped out from under us. It's an elevator. We went down about 20 stories, and um, what was interesting about this elevator is um, normally you have chains that drop these things, these huge worm screws were uh, lowering the platform down, when we, which allows it to carry extreme weight. When we got down there, there was um, a lot of various uh, aircraft and um, workshops and offices and such. There was an off of the main bay, and then off of the main bay were smaller but still rather large work bays. And in the work bays, um, we went down to one that had uh, something sitting in, uh, in, in one of the big workshops. So we went inside, they opened the doors, we went inside, and the room was lit up like um, if you ever seen a car sitting in a paint booth. Uh, you have horizontal lights running the whole length of the room, and they arc like a rainbow all the way over. The reason being, uh, like in a paint booth, uh, it casts no shadows. So if you're spraying a car, if you see a run and your shadow's hiding it, you'll put a run in the car. So, so this was the same reason. Um, it's a good laboratory to do it that way. That means that it's casting those shadows, so whatever you're working on, you can see it without being interfering with the light. And um, that was the first thing that's different about the room. They pulled the big covers off this thing, and um, it was interesting. It's an engine that about the size of a school bus, and this engine is a pretty much a much larger version of the thing I built. It's also an electric magnetic fusion containment engine. But it is sophisticated and it is powerful. Um, I would have to compare mine to it. it. Would be like I had a Model A, and this thing was a Ferrari. I mean, it's just a tremendous, powerful difference. But we both were of the same engine breed, and um, this one had been damaged right in the center of the core. Uh, in the type of configurations we build, we have dual particle accelerators that cause the fusion reaction right in that center of these uh, accelerators is an area that uh, I call the eye of the hurricane and it's like an infinity pattern figure eight and right in the center it's quiet there on a matter of conversion area so um, then this particular engine was a hole there about four feet in diameter um, and uh, that was the first thing I noticed they asked me to look at it and uh, and describe to them how I thought the thing functioned and I asked them um, you know, how come um, I'm telling you about your engine? And they said that the engine was recovered in a um, project they was working with and they weren't sure how the, everything functioned on it and um, personnel that were available that work on that was not available anymore. And they said, could, if I could just help them out a little bit. Well, being 17 years old at the time, um, they uh, thought I didn't pick up on too many adult innuendos. But I was, I guess I was born old. I knew exactly what they were doing. So I said, fine, you know, yeah, I'd be glad to help my country, you know. Yeah. So we play along, and I asked them, can I walk up to it? 